Thank you, uh, John, and uh, Minister Subianto. That was a fantastic speech. Uh, thank you for that. I'm, I'm from Pakistan. I work for a think tank called Tabad Lab in Islamabad. When there is justice, when there is real democracy, when there is accountability of leaders, when there is equal treatment in the course of law, all these factors will make the extremist and radical propagators irrelevant. all, I think, agree that this world, that our Earth has become a small planet. And we are, all of us, facing common global threats to our security and our livelihood. I've been told by experts in Indonesia, even if Indonesia is not involved in any open conflict, if there is a nuclear war, the difference between those directly involved and Indonesia is we will die a slower death, but we will suffer as well. However, I am of the opinion that the leaders of the two leading powers in this great rivalry are actually wise leaders, distinguished friends. The adagium that might makes right actually is not an eternal adagium. When there's a mighty power, there usually will come a mightier power in the neighborhood. That is the history of mankind. Thank you, Minister, for those opening uh, remarks and uh, we will certainly distribute your uh, remarks as soon as uh, we have them uh, finalized. I was lucky enough to read your full text and there are many other perceptions there that I think could be usefully shared. We might just take one or two questions before we uh, leave now for dinner. I might just ask you uh, the first. you mentioned um, in your remarks that you respect the sovereign decisions that countries in the region take to protect uh, their strategic interests in the way in which they uh, choose. Uh, recently, there has been a, a new, uh, very specialized uh, minilateral arrangement made between uh, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Australia to support nuclear propulsion in uh, Australia and also to share uh, technology in the cyber and AI and quantum realms. Is that a, a minilateral arrangement that Indonesia can see as supportive of uh, the strategic situation in the Indo-Pacific? Yeah. Well, uh, officially our position is that of course uh, Southeast Asia should remain nuclear free. And the fear, of course, among Southeast Asian nations is that this will spark an arms race. This will spark more countries seeking uh, nuclear submarines. And uh, we know that now the technology is there. I think uh, many other countries can very soon have nuclear submarines. I would say Japan, India, and uh, many, many other countries. So that's the concern. But as I said, uh, the, the emphasis of every country is to protect their national interest. If they feel threatened, 
if they feel that they have an existential threat, they will do whatever they can to protect themselves. And this is what I mean, that we understand that and we respect them. And therefore, for us, it, it makes us even more uh, uh, anxious to maintain dialogue, to maintain relationship, to mediate between these great powers. But as I said, that uh, every country will do what they can to protect their national interest. If they feel threatened, I, we fully understand what they will do. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Mm. I thought there was one question from here, um, from uh, Musharraf Zaidi. Yes, if you stand, the microphone is right to your right, and we'll close with that question. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, John, and uh, Minister Subianto. That was a fantastic speech. Uh, thank you for that. I'm, I'm from Pakistan. I work for a think tank called Tabad Lab in Islamabad. Uh, we in Pakistan have always admired and maybe almost enviously looked at Indonesia as, uh, as a big brother, uh, being the largest Muslim-majority country on the planet. You just mentioned the other big factor that we've envied, which is, of course, civilian supremacy and the military's voluntary withdrawal from public life and political life in the way that you described. And the other thing we've always admired about Indonesia is that we've always felt that the problem of extremism, um, of course you've had a difficult challenge with terrorism, but the problem of extremism in your society isn't as profound or as problematic as, as maybe we've had to deal with and are dealing with currently. Over the last few years though, as you successfully fought the war on terror, which Pakistan also did in obviously different contexts with some connections, including Al-Qaeda's influence both in our part of the world and your part of the world, uh, there, was a, uh, there was an increase in extremism in society more broadly. So I wanted you to maybe talk to us a little bit, not so much about the success of beating down terrorism, uh, which you've successfully done, but the challenge of the coming decade and, and longer in terms of the pressures on politics and society and the state from within society, uh, the growth of extremism so that the strength that you have as a Muslim majority nation uh, slowly begins to maybe corrode at some of the other strengths that you have as a society and, uh, and then threatens obviously the wider ambitions in Indonesia has both within the country and, and beyond its borders. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your uh, question and your kind words about Indonesia. Uh, as you know, we also uh, admire Pakistan. Uh, I would like to make uh, this uh, observation. I believe from my own uh, experience that extremism, radicalism of any, any sort will thrive when there is poverty, when there is inequality, when there is injustice, when the common people lose hope when the poor do not get the same treatment in the courts of law, when they feel abandoned by the powerful, this is fertile ground for radicalism, for extremism. When there is justice, when there is real democracy, when there is accountability of leaders, when there is equal treatment in the course of law, all these factors will make the extremist and radical propagators irrelevant. This is my conviction. So the challenge is how do we provide these essentials? social justice, economic justice, clean government, rule of law, equality of 
law in front of the courts. This is my conviction. And uh, then we can have prosperity. Then we can have uh, peace. This is our experience. This is our experience. We actually are blessed with a lot of wealth. But many of this wealth does not trickle down to the poor, to the masses. But we have done great strides. We have done great strides. But there is always rising expectation. When the poor, through the digital revolution, they see on television, they see the cars, they see the nice buildings, they see air condition, they see all these modern attributes, and they have no access. That, I think, is fertile ground for radicalism. Thank you. That's my opinion. Thank you. Minister Prabowo, thank you very much for your opening address. I mentioned that the security situations in the Indo-Pacific and the Middle East were codependent. It's excellent that you bring to us um, the perspective from the Indo-Pacific and that your relations with your colleagues in this part of the world are indeed so collegial uh, that we can find uh, multilateral solutions uh, for peace and prosperity between the Middle East and the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you very much for joining us and you've sung for your supper. It's time for you to enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the